we must all remember the lessons of the past as a guide for the management of the present and the planning for the future. I am the son of sugar workers who hasn't forgotten his roots. Welcome to the Pepper Pot. Sitaram, assalamu alaikum, and welcome to the Pepper Pot. While stories of Indians signing indentured contracts to work on British Guyana's plantations are well documented, less is known about the tactics employed by recruiters to coerce them into signing those contracts. Some believe that they were going to Chile Chine, meaning stir sugar and earn easy money. For others, their destination was largely unknown. A folk song sung in British Guyana for generations provides as follows. When we reached Calcutta, our miseries increased. We were stripped of all our beautiful clothes, rosary beads, and sacred threads. Bengali rags decorated us now. The sadhu's hair was shaved. And sadhu, dom, chamar, and bungi all were thrown together in a room. For many indentured Indians, this was only the beginning of their journey to freedom. The main source for planter control over indentured workers was the indentured contract. You see, planters saw the contract as an instrument to structure labor relations and to fulfill their production and profit accumulation motives. Now, indentured workers typically signed away their freedom for three to five years under these contracts. They received wages, small amounts of land, and sometimes a return passage to India once their contract was over. In exchange, planters were required to provide regular work six days a week. Adult males received a wage of one shilling a day, roughly four and a half pounds today, while women and children received considerably less. Now, as a legal document, the indentured contract legitimized many restrictive labor practices. According to Parbati Ramsaran, these contracts underwrote collective bargaining procedures, the enforcement of labor laws, back-to-work legislation, subsistence requirements, and wages. You see, planters and colonial authorities continued to modify indentured contracts over the next several decades, ensuring that they were tantamount to penal contracts and that indentured laborers would face incarceration or heavy fines for noncompliance. Now, after the first indentured laborers arrived from India in 1838, the British opened new prisons to enforce their contracts. These included institutions at Fellowship in Mahaika in 1868 and Sudi in 1875. Now, in 1884, British Guyana's jails held 4,659 people, of which 2,043 were Indian. According to Kelly Moss, Esther Adams, and Deborah Toner, Indians convicted for violations of contract, some 43.9%, accounted for the largest number of persons convicted in 1884. Now, although they undoubtedly served sentences of less than three months, this is remarkable given that Indians comprised just 12% of the colony's total population that year. In the decades that followed, indentured Indians who were incarcerated were sent to work on neighboring estates rather than prison. According to Kelly Moss and Charmaine Joseph Jackson, this policy was a response to an 1867 report from the acting immigration agent general, Dennis Gallagher, who claimed that prison was harsh on both laborers and employers. He recommended that indentured immigrants be sentenced to work on estates other than those they had been indentured to. The colony eventually adopted Gallagher's recommendations, adding that any wages earned by indentured Indians during their imprisonment would go to the government to cover the cost of their punishment. 
But beyond prison, these contracts also controlled the movement of indentured Indians both on and off plantations. In fact, in 1864, a vagrancy clause in British Guyana restricted laborers to a two-mile radius of their plantation. Those found beyond two miles of their plantation, without written permission, would be liable for fines and potentially even criminal charges. You see, these measures prevented many from filing complaints against their employers as they had to go to the immigration office in Georgetown, which was often several miles away from their plantation. As such, laborers would need permission from the very people they sought to complain against. In fact, in 1887, there were 17,770 indentured laborers in British Guyana. That year, employers filed 2,848 complaints against them, who, in total, only filed five. Imagine that. Some paper with some words, some English, some Hindi. But regardless of the length or the language, most of our people likely couldn't read or understand these pieces of paper called a contract. To think that hundreds of thousands of people with no formal education could agree to contract to work in a faraway land for years is irresponsible and downright unconscionable. Yes, they were there to stir sugar, but they were not there to make money for themselves. demonstrations, strikes, assaults on managers, and passive resistance, like performing substandard work, were among the limited forms of protest available to indentured Indians. In one case, a man named Abdullah burned down part of his employer's cane field, causing hundreds of dollars worth of damage in the process. But for others, their indentureship proved unbearable, leaving them with no other option but to run. In 1887, 588 indentured Indians, 490 men, and 98 women fled from their estates. There were likely dire consequences for Abdullah and those captured after running, which is why many indentured Indians resorted to more peaceful forms of protest, such as singing. For example, the songs that formed the basis of Von Prakush Fatuk's 1964 paper entitled Protest Songs of East Indians in British Guyana were recorded between August and September of 1962. Now most of the nearly 900 songs are sung in Bhojpuri, the language of the area from which most indentured Indians are from. In fact, many are traditional songs which are sung on ceremonial occasions in India. However, a few are of a more recent origin and are often described as protest songs. You see, these are songs which deal with the trials of the period of recruitment, the ocean voyage to British Guyana, and the time of indenture on the sugar estates. They tell of outstanding events in British Guyana's history, of the political events leading to India's freedom, seen from the vantage point of the immigrant, and of the attempts to gain independence for British Guyana. Now most of these songs are sung in what is described as creolized Hindi, which differs from the Bhojpuri of the older songs brought from India. In fact, some are sung entirely in Taki-Taki, or Creole English which is spoken by working-class Indians and Africans in British Guyana. Still, some are incredibly unique in that they have Creole English verses with a Creole Hindi chorus. The songs are generally accompanied by classic Indian instruments like the tabla, harmonium, sarangi, and cymbals. They provide essential social and political commentary on the life Indians faced before, during, and after indentureship. The following song describes the experiences of indentured laborers on the plantations. These moneyed people have become our masters. They now do what comes to their minds. They made us clear the whole jungle. They made us cut cane, dig trenches. Harshly are we driven to build their palaces, to dig their canals, and to build their big city, Georgetown. And we wander street to street, remaining beggars.
The indentured Indian strikes that occurred in British Guyana were some of the most significant moments of resistance against the exploitative labor practices that characterized the period. These events, which included protests at Devonshire Castle, Essequibo, Lusignan, and Plantation Rose Hall, were often marked by violent clashes between workers and the police, resulting in both serious injuries and the senseless loss of life. For example, in 1913 at Plantation Rose Hall, police opened fire on protesting workers, killing 15, including a woman who was shot in the stomach. Now another 39 workers were seriously injured, some of whom required amputations. Now these events underscore the brutal realities of life for indentured laborers during indentureship, who were often subjected to appalling working conditions and faced severe repercussions when they dared to resist. Now similar stories of worker uprisings played out across the Caribbean, as indentured Indians fought back against their employers in a struggle for basic human rights and dignity. For example, Conditions on Suriname sugar plantations were miserable for the roughly 34,000 indentured Indians recruited to work there between 1873 and 1916. You see, laborers were often overworked, received low wages, and were confined to poor living arrangements. In fact, in July 1902, laborers at the Marienburg factory and sugar plantation, located in the district of Kumovain in northern Suriname, went on strike. Now, during the strike, a Scottish overseer named James Mayer was killed by a group of Indians protesting their work conditions. You see, Mayer was known for abusing workers, cutting their wages, and harassing women at the plantation. But in response to the strike, Dutch authorities sent in the army to restore order. In total, 24 laborers were murdered, while another 39 were wounded, marking the largest massacre of indentured Indians in the Caribbean. In the aftermath of the massacre, the bodies of the deceased were dumped into unmarked graves along the train tracks that transported sugarcane to the plantation. For good measure, a layer of quicklime was poured into the graves to help decompose the bodies and mask the smell of death. To commemorate the uprising, a monument was unveiled at the Marienburg Plantation on July 30, 2006. In 2012, Benjamin Mitrasing, an archaeologist in Suriname, proposed using modern technology and aerial surveys to locate the unmarked graves. Now, according to Mitrasing, the lime should appear in aerial surveys as it would have changed the texture and color of the soil. The project garnered widespread attention. However, it was halted due to a lack of financial resources. But for those wondering what happened to the Marienburg plantation, it was closed in 1986. However, it has since reopened as a tourist attraction. For that reason, it is important to remember the atrocities that took place here and the efforts of indentured Indians in Suriname and across the Caribbean to secure and enforce their rights. <laughs>